You may be wondering if it is um, a tad weird to uh, be preaching basically to a wall today, um, but no, it's not because I go through my sermon like you know eight times preaching to myself, so so I'm good to go. And I'm not preaching to a wall. I got eleven of my closest friends who are here with me today in the auditorium celebrating my birthday with me because nobody else decided to show up for my birthday. But that's that's okay. So, you know, when Josh and I were talking about songs earlier this week, um, we didn't know how everything was going to unfold so rapidly, and we were going to be having church this way, and um, so cool to be singing about this is how we fight our battles, and that, and that Christ is Lord of all, and we can, be, we can rest assured in that. So the band's going to come up. And we're going to sing one more song here after I'm done. But but welcome to week three of The Comeback. And um, in this series called The Comeback, we're talking about different comeback stories from Scripture. And um, sometimes we need a comeback because of bad decisions and bad, de and bad choices that we've made, as was the case with our story involving Samson last week. And sometimes we need a comeback because of things that are happening to us, even though we may not deserve it or, you know, it wasn't our fault, as was the case with Joseph in week one of this series. So not every comeback is the same and not every comeback plays out the same way. Now, there, there's not always the same amount on the plus side of the comeback in everybody's comeback. We said in week one of Joseph that Joseph had 80 years on the plus side of his comeback. But Samson last week maybe had 80 seconds. Uh, we don't even know if it lasted that long. So not every comeback is the same, but a comeback is a comeback and everybody needs a comeback story. So today I, I want to talk about the story of Jonah with you. And I want to talk about it with this idea that we serve a God of the second chance. Thank God we serve a God of the second chance. Aren't you glad that we serve a God of the second chance? And third, fourth, fifth, sixth chance as well. You see, in order for you and I to take advantage of the comeback, we have to see... And we have to believe that we do serve the God of second chances. Because if we're not going to believe that we serve the God of the second chances, then, then the only thing to believe is the opposite. And the opposite of that is, oh, I've messed up way too much. I've messed up one too many times. I, I, I really blew it this time. That there's no hope for me now, so why should I even try? And I'm here to convince you, if you haven't already been convinced, that because we serve the God of the second chance, we need to keep trying. We need to keep pressing on. We need to keep moving in the direction that God wants us to move in. So all throughout the sermon today, when I talk about the God of the second chance, understand that I'm implying third, fourth, fifth, one hundredth chance that he gives us, and I thank God for that. And I wonder right there where you are, you can respond to this question by, by raising your hand in the auditorium of your house. Has anybody ever needed a second chance? Are you glad that God offers a second chance. Because if you're honest, I believe that there are hands being raised in living rooms all throughout Monroe County right now because we all, and Toledo, and Toledo, my bad, they won't leave out Toledo, because we all need second chances. Now the comeback in our story takes place at the end of chapter two and all of chapter three. But before we get into the comeback of Jonah, we have to talk about what happened that need, where he needed a comeback, that caused him to need a comeback. And you need to understand that Joseph, or excuse me, Joseph, that's week one, Jonah was a prophet of God. And, and, and prophets received messages from the Lord that they were to share to the people. Jonah was a minor prophet. 
You have major prophets and you have minor prophets. The major prophets are Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Daniel. And the minor prophets are basically everybody at the end of your Old Testament of Scripture. People like Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. All of those are minor prophets. Now, please understand, these minor prophets weren't lesser. They, they weren't less important than the major prophets. The only thing that determined whether someone was a major prophet or a minor prophet was how long their letter was. How long the letter was that's recorded in scripture. So Jonah, this prophet, receives this message from God. He receives this word from the Lord that's saying, this is what I want you to do. This is what I need you to do. This is what needs to be carried out. And we see the marching orders that Jonah gets in Jonah chapter 1 and verses 1 and 2. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. So here are the marching orders. Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and basically tell them, y'all are rotten, man. Y'all are rotten people. You guys are so bad and you need to repent of your wicked ways in which you have many. You have so many wicked ways in your life. And if they don't do that, they're going to be destroyed. This is, this is the response by Jonah in verse 3 after God says basically, this is what I want you to do. This is what I need you to do. Here's Jonah's response in verse 3. But Jonah. I'm going to stop right there. Remember last week we said that every comeback begins with a but? <laughs> but God. Well, Jonah's downfall began with a but. But Jonah. What did he do? He rose to flee to Tarshish, not Nineveh, from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and he went on board to go with them to Tarshish. Now, now check out this last phrase, away from the presence of the Lord. Now a couple things here in just these first couple verses. What kind of prophet is Jonah to, to receive this, this message from God, this word from the Lord of this is what I want you to do and him, you know, even think, you know what? No, I don't think so. Let alone actually say, no, I don't think so. I, I mean, God says, all right, Jonah, I, I got big plans for you, right? I want you, to, I want you to go to Nineveh because they really need me. They need the truth of the word of God. And, and you need to tell them to repent. And you need to tell them that if they don't, they're going to be destroyed. And Jonah kind of leans in and he's like, what else you got? Like, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. You know, I, I mean, the nerve of him as a prophet of God to say, no, I'm not going to do this. He didn't really, he didn't actually say, no, God, but his actions implied it, that he wasn't going to listen to God's message. You see, Nineveh was about 600 miles east of Joppa, and Tarshish is about 2,500 miles west of Joppa. So we see here that he is going to go as far in the opposite direction as what God is telling him to do. Now, here's what's real easy to do. It's real easy to listen to the story and think, Jonah, come on, man. How dumb can you be? I mean, really, think about it. You're going to really try to run away from the presence of God. I mean, how dumb can one person be? It's not even possible. What are you thinking? And I think some of you know where I'm going with this, right? Because we look at other people and we think, how can you be so dumb? Like, like how can you be so stupid? Why, why do you think you can get away with this? Why do you think this is even possible? Where we tell other people these type of things, but then we try to do the exact same thing. How many times in your life have you, have you known that God wanted you to do something and you did something totally different? 
You, you, God wanted you to go in a certain direction. And you tried to go as far in the other direction as possible. It's real easy to, to in this story to be like, Jonah, come on, man. Like, like, don't be so dumb. Why would you do that? Where in all reality, what we should be saying is, Jonah, I feel you, man. <laughs> I feel you. I'm right there with you, buddy. I, I've done the exact same thing in my life as well. Now, why didn't Jonah want to go to Nineveh? I, I mean, why didn't he want to go to Nineveh? And I, I'm sure his message um, probably wasn't, turn or burn, people. You know, get saved or be microwaved, all right? That hopefully that wasn't his message. It, it was just a message of you guys need to repent. You need to repent of your ways. Why didn't he want to do that? He was scared to death. He was afraid. He was afraid for his life because Nineveh was the center of crime. It was the center of wickedness. It was the center of sin. Now, I would think... So isn't that where the prophet of God really should go? <laughs> you know, it, aren't those the people that really needed the message that Jonah had? Yeah, for sure. But it didn't take away the fact that he was afraid. He was fearing for his life. And the other thing we see is Jonah also probably didn't want to go to Nineveh to tell them that they need to repent and God loves them and God wants to save them because the people that resided in Nineveh were his enemies. They, they were people that, you know, did bad things and were out to get people like Jonah and other people. So why would God want to show love to, to my enemies and use me to take that message to them? And I think that's something to consider because maybe God is impressing that upon our heart that this is exactly who I want you to go share the love of God with. And we're like, Oh, but, but I don't like that person and that person doesn't like me. But that is the situation that God wants to find ourselves in. So Jonah's on a boat going in the opposite direction of where he was supposed to be going. And, and the opposite direction of doing what he was supposed to be doing. And so God immediately sends a storm. He sends a, he sends a sign of his disapproval. And the story says that, that the mariners, that the uh, professional boat people <laughs> were, were scared to death. That's how bad of a storm this was that they find themselves in the middle of. And so they start picking up stuff and they're throwing stuff overboard and they're like, man, we need to make the boat lighter and maybe it's not going to sink. And, and they're just going crazy and frantic and, and everything is chaotic kind of what we're experiencing right now in, in our society, right? And, and in all of this, I mean, George Clooney is up top trying to weather the perfect storm, and where do we see Jonah? If you've never seen the movie Perfect Storm, then you have no idea what that reference is, but that's okay, all right? But this is where we see Jonah in verse 5 of chapter 1. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, small g, and they hurled the, car the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and it laid down and was fast asleep. Now one may think, how is someone going in the opposite direction and outside of the will of God, how are they able to sleep soundly? And once again, I think we've all found ourselves in that situation where our life is not where it needs to be. We're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. And even though God may send a storm into our life to wake us up, we kind of ignore it. And we still find ourselves fast asleep. So this captain basically says to him, how can you be sleeping, man? Like, we're going down. Like, there's a real good chance we're going to die. And you're down here taking a nappy nap? Like, like, how in the world is that even possible? Why don't you pray to your God like we're praying to our God? Now, Jonah knew why this was happening. He knew this was happening because he was running away from God. He knew it was his fault. And he told the other guys that on the boat. He's like, hey, hey, this is going on right now because of me. Because I'm trying to run away from the presence of God. 
because I'm trying to go in the opposite direction of what God wants me to do. And the rest of the crew is like, all right, cool. What do we do to make it stop? <laughs> like, like, how do we all not die in the meantime of your stupidity, of your rebellion, of your defiance? Like, like, like how can the rest of us, you know, figure out what we're supposed to do? And this is what he says in verse 12. He said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. <laughs> and you know what? The guys didn't want to do it. It says in verse 13 that they tried to row harder and harder to be able to get the boat to land. Now let's think about this. If that's you and me, right? And we're on a boat and things are going crazy. And someone like Jonah comes up to me, us and says, you know what? Hey, I want you guys to know this is taking place because of me. So if you guys throw me overboard, you're going to be okay. What are we going to do? See you, buddy. Right? Okay, man. Good luck. Right? We're throwing him overboard. But, but they didn't want to throw him overboard. But they fi he finally convinced them that this is what you guys need to do. Now, isn't that remarkable that, that Jonah is in the middle of defying God? He's in the middle of disobeying God, yet he still knows in his heart what needs to be done in order for things to be made right. And, and I think that's pretty remarkable. And I think that speaks to what we're talking about here, that we serve a God of the second chance. That even though we maybe are going in the opposite direction, and even though we're maybe doing things that we're not supposed to be doing and we're fumbling the ball, that God still doesn't give up on us. And he still tries to impress on our heart, hey, this is what I want you to do. This is what I need you to do. Verse 15, so they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, <laughs> and the sea ceased from its raging. Folks, I need you to see something before we go any further, and, and, because if you haven't really focused in on this yet, I need you to focus in on the fact that we serve a God of the second chances and thank God for second chances. And we're gonna see a second chance for Jonah. Verse 17, here it comes. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, I really, in all honesty, I really wanted, I wanted Linda Perry up here behind me with a flannel graph board and kind of flannel graphing this story as I was teaching it, but we just couldn't, we just couldn't pull it off. But maybe sometime in the future, Linda, all right, we'll be able to pull that off. But I want you to see here, you may be thinking, what is good about being swallowed up by a great fish? It beats the alternative. It beats the alternative of drowning. It beats the alternative of, I'm sure if Jaws was in the area, he would have swallowed him up, but only after biting him into a thousand pieces, right? It beats the alternative for Joseph. Folks, you need to realize that, that all of this transpiring, this is God's second chance for Jonah. This is his second chance to get things Right, because God could have easily let him drown. You know what, man? You disobeyed me. And you're, you're one of my prophets. You're one of my right-hand guys. And I told you to do something. He didn't do it. So, so just go ahead and die. He could have very easily did that, but he didn't. Folks, aren't you glad that when we disappoint God, when we let him down, when we turn and run the other way, that he doesn't give up on us, that he doesn't lose hope in us, that he doesn't lose faith in us, he still doesn't give up on Jonah. But you know what God knew he had to do in Jonah's life? He knew he had to get Jonah in a place where the only voice he could hear was God's voice. He, need, he needed to get Jonah in a place where he was rid of all of the other distractions in his life. 
And I wonder if you can, if you can relate to that. And if you have a situation in your life where God was trying to speak to you, you weren't listening, you weren't doing what God was telling you to do, and it took a situation, it took God allowing something to take place in your life so he could have your undivided attention. And there were no other distractions. And this is what we see here. This is what he had to do for Jonah. And I know we've said this a lot in past series, but it's always true. God put Jonah in a place where he could see what he needed to see so he could do what he needed to do in order to be who he needed to be. And it was up to Jonah to take advantage of this opportunity. Now, I don't just want to move through quickly. I want to say this. There is great significance and there is great similarity in the fact that the verse said he was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. There's great significance in that, symbolizing a resurrection of sorts for Jonah, just like Jesus was in the tomb for three days and three nights before resurrecting. Now, remember last week we said that Samson's comeback started with a prayer. And, and most of our comebacks are going to start with a prayer. Well, guess what? We see the same thing here in this story. Jonah's comeback begins with a prayer. Jonah chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. Folks, aren't you glad that even in the middle of our mistakes, even in the middle of our wrongdoings, even in the middle of us trying to run away from what God wants us to do, that out of our distress, when we call out to God out of our distress, he still hears us and he still answers that prayer. All of chapter two is a prayer. One prayer, and it's a prayer of confession. It's a prayer of repentance. Because once again, just like we saw in the story of Samson last week, he wanted to do something through Jonah, but he had to do something in Jonah before he could do something through him. And he had to get to the place where he needed to be. Folks, let me, let me point out to you that before you can take advantage of the second chance that God is offering, before you can take advantage of the comeback that God wants to write in your life, most of the time, before any of that can happen, you need to begin with a prayer of confession and repentance. That's where it starts. You need to own up to what's going on in your life that doesn't need to be there. You need to confess that to the Lord. You need to repent to the Lord and ask for forgiveness. Then he'll allow you to take advantage of the second chance he's offering. Then he will continue to write the narrative of your comeback story if you do these things. Now, I would say that the comeback started for Jonah the moment he was thrown overboard. And the comeback continued when the great fish came and swallowed him up. Well, we see that the, co the comeback continues even more at the end of chapter 2, verse 10. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Now, a couple of weeks ago, um, my family and I, we were, we were talking about this story of Jonah. And... Um, we were, we were talking about how everything transpired and played out. And so we started searching on YouTube um, animated videos of, of this story. And, and especially the part of Jonah being vomited up on the shore. And, and I'm going to show you the one that, that we laughed at the most. I'm going to show you the one that we thought was the best. Not the most accurate, okay? This is not most likely how it happened, but we thought this was funny. So don't miss it because it's only like seven seconds long, okay? So you watch this amazing video of Jonah being vomited up on the dry land. Watch this. Safe. On the fourth day, the whale opened its mouth and spit Jonah onto the beach. Isn't that amazing? 
I mean, come on, that is absolutely amazing. Hold on, let's, let, let's go back because some of you missed it, even though I told you it was only seven seconds long, okay? Like, click Six. on that again and watch this again. On the fourth day, the whale opened its mouth and spit Jonah onto the beach. If that's how it happened, dude just broke his back, right? I mean, he just <laughs> broke his back. He's not surviving that. And it's almost like in slow motion that, you know, when he's going through the air, I can feel him, like, singing, don't call it a comeback, I've been here for years. <laughs> Probably not, okay, but thank you for putting up with my humor, all right, at least. But we just wanted to give you a little visual of the story here, basically because we couldn't go all flannel of breath um, for you today, all right? So... The, the, the comeback continues here in chapter 3. And, and, and look, listen to this message. Look at this message. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah, what? The second time. The second time. Implying that this message had already come to him once, which it had. But he's now... Being, he's now receiving this message the second time. He's getting a second chance to do what he should have been doing all along. Verse 2, here's the message. Here's the marching orders. Say marching orders. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. Do you notice that the marching orders didn't change just because Jonah balked the first time? Just because Jonah was like, nah, I don't think so. God had a purpose for Jonah. And God had a message for Jonah. And so we see here that, that, that the mission is the same. Get up, go to Nineveh, tell them they need to repent. So Jonah continues his comeback. And the only reason why his comeback was able to continue is because he obeyed God. He did what God wanted him to do. He did what he was telling him to do. And I'm telling you guys that our comeback stories are contingent not only about us hearing from God, but on us doing what God is telling us to do by being obedient. And so here's his second chance, and this is what he does in verse 3 of chapter 3. He arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Here's what I want you to see with this. God didn't just spare Jonah's life so that Jonah could just limp to the finish line of his life. He, did, he didn't just spare Jonah so Jonah could be miserable and just kind of be, you know, non-existent and not be and not play a big role in what God wanted him to do. And, you know, I'll just hold on until I die. No, God spared Jonah because he had great plans for Jonah still. He still had a mission for him to be a part of. God spared his life, but then commissioned him again to take that message to the people of Nineveh, to be his mouthpiece. Folks, if God, if God spares you, if God saves you, it's not just for you and I to just go through the motions after that until we die. He spares us because he wants to use us. He saves us because he has a plan for us. He has a mission for us that we need to be a part of. And so Jonah takes advantage of this second chance. And I think we need to stop and just say, thank you, Lord, for second chances. Thank you for third chances. Thank you for fourth chances. God, thank you for never giving up on me. When, when I don't get it right, and I, and I don't get it right often, God, thank you for your second chance. Now, here's what happens in Nineveh. And we're going to read a, a, a couple verses here just to explain the story to you. Okay, You can follow along there in your Bibles, on your device, on the screen. Verse 4. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey. And he called out, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. 
And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. And let them call out mightily to God, capital G, to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. So this king is crying out, and he's saying, people, we can only control what we can control. We need to handle our business. We need to do what we're being told to do, and maybe God won't destroy us. There was no guarantee, but God came through. Now, don't miss this. this is, I, I want you to see this as we kind of we wrap this story up. Jonah wasn't the only one who experienced the comeback. But because of Jonah's comeback, the entire city of Nineveh experienced the comeback. Now we've mentioned that in this series already, that what if, what if your comeback, what if my comeback is going to encourage and inspire someone else to experience their comeback? What if, what if other people's comebacks are contingent upon my comeback? And upon your comeback. Because what if, what if Jonah didn't listen? What if on round two, even after being swallowed by a great fish and vomited up on the, on the shore, what if he still said, eh, eh, no, I, no, don't want to do it? Well, what would have happened? Not only would Jonah not have experienced his comeback, but the city of Nineveh would not have experienced their comeback. And they would have been destroyed. So when Nineveh cries out and they truly repent, you know what God says? God says, hey, I'm not just the God of the second chance for Jonah. I'm God of the second chance for the city of Nineveh. I'm God of the second chance for all of you also. God is the God of the second chance. He's the God of the comeback. And I don't know, I don't know what you need to draw from this. I don't know what you need to learn from this lesson here today. But maybe some of you need to be convinced today that the love that God offers is greater than your unforgiveness that you're experiencing right now. The love of God is greater than your current bitterness. The, the love of God is greater than the shame and the guilt and the condemnation that you experience and you battle on a daily basis. That the love of God is greater than all of those things. You've got to believe that. You've got to be convinced of that before you and I are ever going to be able to live like that. Folks, Jesus gave us everything so we could take advantage of the second chances that he offers us. The entire book, Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21 is filled with second chances. Thank God for that. Thank God for his second chances. I want you to hear this. Don't, don't tune me out yet. Um, you know, if you've got a snack from the kitchen, hopefully you made it back by now, all right, before we sing the last song or anything. But I want you to hear this. Somebody needs to hear this because there is, there is nobody listening to this message. There is nobody on the face of this planet, you hear what I'm saying, that is on take one of their life still. And doesn't need a second chance. There is not one. I, I don't care if you're thinking about the most spiritual person that you know. That person is still not on take one of their life. They needed a second chance. They needed a savior to come in and do what only a savior could do for that Person. You've got to believe that. If you're, if you're listening to this message or if you listen to this series 
and, and you, you, you're still convinced that, you know, yeah, maybe for someone else, Craig, but not for me. And you're still convinced that, that your past or your present has disqualified you from God. God has disqualified you. I'm telling you, you are believing the lie of the enemy because that's not the truth. We serve a God who is seated on a throne that is in control, that is sovereign, that knows exactly what's going on right now in our world, that is the God of the second chance, even for you and even for me. But here's the thing. Here's what we have to do. Everyone is being offered a second chance, but you have to choose that. You have to choose that this is what you want to do. You have to be willing to walk away from everything that is keeping you far away from God. You need to be willing to walk away from everything that's keeping you out of the will of God in order to take advantage of this second chance. Can I encourage you to make a choice today? Right where you are right now today, make a choice that you're going to stop running from God and you're going to begin running to God. Or you're going to continue to run to God. You need to be convinced of this because when you do that, then your comeback story can play out and you can impact and influence other people in their comeback stories. And oh, what a story that will be when you get to share that with other people. Let me close with this. In the book of Jonah, the, the headings in, in, in people's Bibles, they, they kind of differ, but they kind of carry with it the same, the same idea. And the main parts of the book are broken down like this. Jonah flees, God saves, Jonah prays, and then Jonah goes. Now here's the thing. Too many times in our life, we're in this cycle and we only do the first three. We, we flee, we fall away from God. God. God still chooses to rescue us. We, we talk to God, we say, God, I'm sorry, please forgive me. What do you need me to do? He gives us our marching orders. Maybe they're new marching orders, maybe, maybe they're the same, but then we don't do the fourth step. We don't go, we don't obey. And so we go back and we repeat the cycle all over again. We, we, we wander away from God. God is still there to rescue us and save us. We pray, we cry out. We get, we get an idea of what God wants us to do. And unless we go, unless we do the fourth step, unless we go like Jonah went and took advantage of God's second chance, unless we go, our comeback story is not going to be the way that God wants it to be. And it's not going to be the way that we want it to be. We have to be willing to obey. We have to be willing to go. Then the narrative of our comeback story can change. And it can play out the way that it's supposed to play out. Would you, would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me right, right where you are, wherever you're watching this video today. And we do thank you so much for joining in today for worshiping with us. We don't know how long church is gonna be this way, but thank God we at least still have a way to do church. But I wanna encourage you right where you are, whatever, whatever it is, however God is speaking to you can, you, can you talk to God? Maybe you talk to God as a family, if you guys are watching this as a family. Maybe you just talk to God from your heart to God and you're watching this all by yourself. But can you just ask God to reveal to you the things in your life that need to be done differently in order for you to take advantage of the second chance he's offering? Or are, are, you, are you convinced today? I hope you're convinced that God is a God of second chances, even for you and even for me. May we take advantage of this second chance by being obedient, and by doing what God wants us to do. I'm going to pray, and then after I pray, I'm going to get out of the way, and we're going to sing one more song. And, and I don't know how you have chosen to participate with us today. I don't know if you're just watching. I don't know if you're singing out where you are. I hope you are. 
But at the very least, this song needs to be our prayer. It needs to be our prayer concerning how we are going to live our life moving forward. So I pray that you will take advantage of this last song to continue to talk to God, to ask Him to reveal to you what needs to be revealed, whatever it may be. You continue to worship God. God, thank you for today. God, this, this was amazing. What an amazing experience. Knowing that we can, we can still touch and we can still influence so many people's lives, God. God, what a blessing this has been. God, I pray that your perfect will can be done in each and every person's life. That we would be willing to not only cry out to you and ask God, 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 what do you want from me? But that we would be willing to obey and to go. So that we can take advantage of the second chance like Jonah did. And we can have our comeback story continue to be written by an almighty God. So God, thank you for your many blessings. As we continue to worship you, we pray that you are honored and glorified with our efforts. God, we ask all these things in your son's precious name. Amen.